Hi, I'm Trevor Owens, Managing Partner of Stacks Accelerator. My background is as an entrepreneur, advisor, and investor in early stage companies for more than a decade. I created the first training program on Lean Startup Methodologies, working with Eric Ries, the author of The Lean Startup. And we grew that training program to more than 150 cities around the world and helped hundreds of thousands of founders. I was also an early advisor to the founders of Stacks and have followed them for the past eight years. They are the best team I've ever worked with. Their judgment and focus on the right things are second to none. And so when Stacks 2.0 launched in January of this year, I knew I had to be involved. And that's when we came together and created the Stacks Accelerator. So the Stacks Accelerator, our purpose is to create a community around the creation of successful companies built on the Stacks blockchain. Imagine for a second if you could just teleport back in time and get exclusive access to all the best deal flow in startups building on Ethereum. How much would that be worth and what kind of a great experience would that be? Well, that's what it's like being a part of the Stacks Accelerator community today. Stacks is a competitor to Ethereum, with the key difference being that Stacks enables smart contracts to be built on top of Bitcoin, giving it access to a more decentralized and secure network with a larger base of users and capital. And Stacks 2.0 just launched in January and is now growing exponentially, with amazing teams and founders flocking to build on it. So during this presentation, I want to give you an overview of Stacks and the technology, as well as Stacks Accelerator, so you can determine for yourself what is the future potential of this ecosystem. For me, just the potential upside was more than enough for me to go all in on it. So Stacks has a mission to build a user-owned internet where you have true ownership of your identity, data, and wealth. The Stacks technology was developed by an incredible team with six distributed systems PhDs, two scientists with presidential career awards, and 15,000, over 15,000 research citations among white paper authors. Really, the technology is incredible. The team, uh, led by Muneeb Ali, a PhD in decentralized systems from Princeton, as well as team members from MIT, Stanford, and Harvard, they are one of the most skilled teams in the industry and really have a solid understanding of the industry and the technology. And you'll see that it takes a team like this to really build something that they've built. And so they've also have been backed over the years by some amazing investors. In fact, one person told me this was the Avengers of Silicon Valley based investors. Their lead investor is Union Square Ventures. They have Digital Currency Group. They went through Y Combinator. Also, I was actually helping them with their Y Combinator application in the early days. And Naval Ravikant, a host of the who's who of the blockchain industry is backing this company. And Stacks even did the first ever SEC approved token sale. So this is a team that has been very focused on doing the right things from the beginning. And I think the SEC token sale really shows that they're willing to go above and beyond to do things the right way. And so Stacks started as a company called Blockstack in 2013. They went through Y Combinator. They grew a great team and in 2018 is when they split up and became decentralized so that Stacks could go from being traded as a security to what it is now traded as, as of the beginning of this year, a utility token. And Stacks today is represented by several different entities, including the nonprofit Stacks Foundation, Hero, which works in the core blockchain technology. They're just one of the uh, players contributing to the open source uh, blockchain. New Internet Labs, Damon Technologies, which works on mining, and Freehold, which works on community. And so they have been working with a lot of uh, the best people in the industry for many years, Binance, Coinbase. And just this year, they filed with the SEC to be approved as a utility. They filed their final statement as a security. And so we're expecting some major exchanges before the end of the year to potentially list stacks as well. And so what I'm going to cover is also covered in depth as well in my essay that you can find here at bit.ly slash DAX analysis if you prefer to read. But I'm going to cover most of the content in the following slides. So the way Stacks works is that they developed their own novel consensus mechanism called proof of transfer, which allows Stacks to interoperate with Bitcoin and use Bitcoin as a secure settlement layer for all of their smart contracts. So if you know Bitcoin, it's on a proof of uh, work consensus mechanism. It's incredibly secure. 
it's a strong store of value where most of many large corporations are now holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet. But the problem with Bitcoin is that it has low scalability and there's no smart contracts. And so what Stacks did is they created this consensus mechanism to enable those smart contracts and more technology to exist on top of Bitcoin. They also enable decentralized storage and they have a decentralized identity system. And so on top of Stacks can be built any kind of Web 3.0 crypto startup that you can imagine, whether it comes to decentralized finance, NFTs, prediction markets, it enables extremely scalable decentralized apps. And so the way it works is that every block on the Stacks network is tied to a block on the Bitcoin network. And Stacks enables millions of smart contracts to be represented in a single hash on Bitcoin. And so a lot of people ask, well, isn't Bitcoin slow or isn't Bitcoin expensive? Well, when it comes to the expensive fees on Bitcoin, those fees are represented by the cost per byte that you store on the, on the blockchain. And so with Stacks, they store the minimum amount of data to be referenced as a, as a settlement layer, which means that the fees on Stacks are extremely small. Actually, millions of smart contracts can be represented by a single hash on Bitcoin through something called Stacks app chains. And so millions of smart contracts can result in just a tiny data footprint on the Bitcoin blockchain and right now even the fees are 0.1 penny for all of the transactions on Stacks. Stacks also has something called microblocks, which enables confirmations of transactions within just a few seconds. And so Stacks has an extremely high performance and extremely scalable smart contract platform on top of Bitcoin. And so when it comes to understanding the innovation behind Stacks and their consensus mechanism proof of transfer, First, I want to explain a little bit about the other consensus mechanisms and how this industry has evolved, looking at both proof of work and proof of stake. And so proof of work is the original consensus mechanism that uh, started on Bitcoin and was also adopted by Ethereum, is used on Ethereum today, and used by a few other networks such as Dogecoin. And so the way proof of work functions is that you have, you have mining with hardware and every new block starts with a puzzle. And so there's all these different nodes running hardware to try and solve this puzzle as fast as possible, submitting answers to the network. And the first uh, node that solves the problem, the first miner that solves the problem, gets, the, gets to write the block and gets a reward of, uh, for mining that block in Bitcoin. And so the challenges with this is that it's not very scalable because there's massive amounts of energy using to protect this network. And of course, it's not energy efficient. It's far less efficient than a centralized alternative. In fact, um, that is part of the beauty of Bitcoin as well, is that it's so decentralized and that anyone can run uh, the Bitcoin network on very limited hardware. And so this problem is now also affecting Ethereum. It's why it's having difficulty scaling. And so if we break it down, proof of work, security, extremely high, extremely decentralized, but scalability is low and energy efficiency is low. And so because of these challenges, people started thinking, what can we do about this? And they wanted to come up with an alternative consensus mechanism that would address the scalability and energy usage problems. And so what people came up with was, let's get rid of the puzzles. Let's get rid of the need to run all of this um, massive amounts of energy and hardware to solve these puzzles and that's going to make it more scalable, that's going to make it more energy efficient. Now, the problem with this is how do you actually choose the block winner? How do you, how do you make it a meritocracy where the power doesn't concentrate on any one person? Where anyone running a node or doing the mining can have a chance of almost democratically or merit meritocratically deciding what to write in the next block. And so that was how they came up with proof of stake. And the whole idea with proof of stake is instead of letting these miners solve puzzles, let's simplify it and let's let whoever has the most money or stake make the decision. And it almost sounds preposterous when I say it like this, let's make whoever has the most money make the decision. But that's essentially exactly what it is. 
And so there's all these new blockchains now that are proof of stake blockchains, chains like Tezos, Polkadot, Cardano, EOS Solana. Ethereum 2.0 is planning to move to proof of stake. It's uncertain as to whether they'll be able to move. But this was kind of the wave two or three years ago that all these new blockchains are coming to. And so the way proof of stake works, as I said, whoever has the most stake or the most tokens, the most wealth on the network makes the decisions. In fact, one token equals one vote. So you can see here in this diagram, there's different users with different amounts of stake. And those different users can delegate or vote to their validator to write the next block. And so it ends up being that whoever has the most wealth is most likely to choose the validator who's going to make the next block. Well, you might actually say, isn't this similar to proof of work? Okay, is it, you know, if you're very wealthy and you can actually buy lots of mining equipment. So in some ways, the wealthiest person could participate the most in proof of work, right? Well, not exactly, because the key difference here is between spending wealth versus holding wealth. Just holding wealth on a proof of stake network gives you decision-making power. You're not, you're not required to actively participate. You don't have to spend that wealth. Whereas when it comes to mining on, on the Bitcoin network, those miners actually have to use electricity. They have to continually spend resources in order to participate. And that fundamental difference makes a big difference when it comes to some of the problems. One of the key ones being ideologically that the wealthiest users control the network and they also earn the most fees. So you can hold lots of Bitcoin, but unless you're mining, you're not going to earn more Bitcoin, right? There's a separation between the token holders and the miners. With proof of stake, there's less of a separation. And so the wealthiest users, just by sitting on their stake, continue to accumulate more and more fees and their wealth grows in proportion. Some people have see that as an ideological problem. Secondly, it introduces a security problem. It introduces a new attack vector where token holders and apps that hold custody of tokens can be targeted. So you could imagine a very powerful government or organization blackmailing or trying to abduct one of the wealthiest um, token holders in order to gain power of the network. In addition, uh, exchanges can be hacked or exchanges could collude together because they hold custody of people's tokens and that could be an attack vector for the network. And these attacks are not avoidable. They're not really even detectable because you wouldn't know if a major government was blackmailing a token holder versus on a proof of work network, you can actually see the network ramping up. You can see um, people onboarding more mining and get advance notice of more power maybe going into fewer hands. In addition, the participation in this control is limited to the owners of the token. So token holders don't have to sell you their tokens. If someone is able to control enough of the stake and accumulate enough wealth, they may never sell it to you for any cost. There's no way to buy in. Whereas the proof of work, anyone can add mining hardware to the network, anyone can bind to the system so that attacks are temporary and not final. Versus an attack on a proof of stake network, if someone accumulates enough stake, you can't really take that stake uh, away from them. Okay. And so in practice, proof of stake networks tend to have a participation rate of staking between 10 to 30%. And the two to three largest exchanges collectively tend to own between 10 and 50% of the supply. And so the exchanges having custody people's tokens is a legitimate uh, risk and attack vector for proof of stake networks, which wouldn't be an issue with proof of work. And as I'll show you, is not an issue with proof of with stacks and proof of transfer. And so ideologically speaking, these are all comments from people on forums like Hacker News and Reddit. These are not my own words, but I want to show you some of the, the issues that other people have brought up. Proof of stake is already how our current financial system works. The people with the most money make the decisions. Proof of work is provably resistant to this as evidenced by the 2017 block size debates where almost every large miner and Bitcoin company wanted to change the protocol and it was fought off with gross wrath gross grassroots efforts. And so this is the concern over proof of stake networks, not only from a security standpoint, but also from a ideological standpoint. And famously, um, last month, someone asked Jack Dorsey what he thought about proof of stake. And he responded that he doesn't support proof of stake because of the, it's less secure and it's more centralized. 
And so when it comes to proof of stake, what happened was all of these developers were looking for a new way to fix the problem with proof of work, adding scalability and energy efficiency. However, they made a trade-off and they traded that security and they traded that, that ideology of, hey, Bitcoin is supposed to be a way to create a new financial system that gives power to everybody by creating a system that actually rewards the people, the incumbents and rewards the people with the most stake in the network. And so today, um, before the launch of Stacks 2.0, of course, it was like, there's no good answer. What do we do here? All of these things are desirable. But the team behind Stacks, as I was blown away to learn, has come up with a novel solution to this that actually solves all of these problems. And that is proof of transfer. And so the way proof of transfer works is that it interoperates with Bitcoin and is linked directly to Bitcoin. Mining happens by Bitcoiners spending Bitcoin in order to earn the right to mine a block of stacks and earn stacks. So Bitcoiners are trading Bitcoin in order to get stacks. And in that, the chance of, a, of someone being elected a winner is proportional to the amount that they spend. And there's a, a verifiable random function. And um, what happens is the, um, the Bitcoin that is spent ends up going to the stacks holders. So, so if, you, if you stack your stacks, it's kind of like staking where you, in staking you earn the fees, but instead in stacks, when you stack, you earn the rewards from the Bitcoin mining. And so this creates an interesting DeFi primitive for stacks. And so the benefits of this approach for stacks is number one, that anyone can, part can participate in mining by spending BTC. Okay, so with proof of stake, not anyone can participate. You have to acquire the stake from someone else. And in addition, it's not a passive participation like proof of stake where you're just sitting on your wealth and you maintain decision-making power. Every single round of mining a new block is based on how much BTC is spent by those users to participate in the mining. And so it requires an active participation that is more meritocratic in that way. And in addition, attacks are easily detectable, avoidable, and temporary. If someone tries to spend 100x to mine a block on stacks and tries to make an attack, they have actually have a very uh, advanced system where it would actually take three rounds of doing a 100x spend before you would even get any, um, uh, before you would get any like high chance of predictably winning a block on the stacks blockchain. And so this allows plenty of time for other miners to not only detect an attack, but also to react and either increase their own spend or to just censor that miner and go around them uh, so that integrity can be maintained on the Stacks blockchain. It is in incredibly resilient in that way. In addition, stackers are in BTC, not Stacks. So in proof of stake, if you're staking your token, you're earning the fees in that network. It's a closed loop. But, but with Stacks, the miners are actively part uh, saying that Stacks is valuable and that they're willing to trade their Bitcoin in exchange for Stacks tokens. So there's more real world value and open system to show the value of Stacks. In addition, Stacks doesn't require complicated hardware like Bitcoin. In fact, a old laptop could run a Stacks node. And so there's very minimal additional energy burden. It's just spending BTC. They're not, sol they're not running complex algorithms to solve puzzles and containing lots of energy. It's enabling Bitcoin to have smart contracts with almost no additional energy burden. And one of the things is that if you look at some of the other proof of stake uh, chains where they claim like very high transactions per second, or they claim very uh, fast block times, you want to look at what kind of hardware does it require to actually run a node? Can you actually run a node on a old laptop? which allows, it, allows that network to be more decentralized. It allows more people to participate. Some of these uh, blockchains that claim very high transactions per second are doing it because the nodes require a server or a mainframe to run on them. And that prevents the network from being decentralized. It leads to a less secure and more at risk network. And so proof of transfer is a model that allows blockchains to interoperate, it allows stacks to interop interoperate with Bitcoin and by that same virtue, it allows it to scale so that millions of smart contracts can be contained in a single hash of Bitcoin, meaning that you can put a Stacks chain on top of another Stacks chain and they can interoperate with each other through proof of transfer. 
And this is how out of the box, Stacks is already scalable and allows it to be an extremely scalable blockchain. So when it comes to proof of transfer, Bitcoin is the store of value and Stacks is gas for smart contracts. That's where you can use Stacks to settle smart contracts that fall down and settle onto Bitcoin. And stacking is really amazing. Actually, to date, there's there's been over a billion dollars in, in Stacks locked up to be a part of the smart contract for stacking. And it's really innovative in that you can actually program this into your applications where your users of your app can actually give their stacks to you or they can lock their stacks with you and they can designate a BTC address that's going to earn BTC from the stacks mining. And this opens a lot of new potential for decentralized finance and for entirely new business models. And it's really incredible. And one of the craziest things about Stacks that really blew my mind is if you think about it, when it comes to Bitcoin, they're running all this electricity to solve these puzzles, but that electricity is essentially burned. Whereas with proof of transfer, the Bitcoin they're spending is not burned, it's actually sent to the Stacks holders. And so you can think of this like imagining if the energy used in Bitcoin was redirected to a city that needed it. That's essentially what the Stacks team has brilliantly done with proof of transfer. And so when it comes to proof of transfer, they've really solved all the problems here by using Bitcoin as a secure settlement layer. And it almost functions like two-factor authentication if you think of Bitcoin and Stacks as the relationship. Because it settles onto Bitcoin, it is much harder to reverse transactions and to attack the network of Stacks than it would be if it didn't have this relationship with Bitcoin intertwined. And so the security of Stacks is extremely high, the scalability is extremely high, and also the energy efficiency is really high. And I couldn't believe it when I actually started to look into how, look into this very deeply, but they've solved the core problems of the blockchain industry, in my opinion. And so it's my belief that if your life depended on it, you would want your smart contracts settled on Bitcoin instead of Ethereum. This is not only because Bitcoin is the most decentralized, most secure and long-standing blockchain. It's not only because we know what Bitcoin is going to look like in 10, 20 years. It's going to change very little. And it's withstanded the test of time already, having been live and been secure for more than a decade. But there's also a few other reasons why I think a lot of users, a lot of developers would prefer to use Stacks and settle their smart contracts down to Bitcoin instead. And one of the main reasons comes down to a history lesson on Ethereum. And so, if you were following Ethereum in 2016, you would know about the DAO hack, where there was a hack, a lot of the Ethereum holders lost a lot of money, more than $50 million. This issue probably wouldn't be that much of an issue except for how the Ethereum community responded to it. And the way they responded to it was by reversing the attack. They actually did a hard fork of the network in order to return those funds to their wealthiest holders. And a lot of people sort of had a wake-up call when they saw this. And this was something that would be impossible to do on Bitcoin. But because there is no leader, there, we, no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And people have tried to change Bitcoin. People have tried to use their interest and influence in order to change Bitcoin in a ways that they wanted and they failed. But they have succeeded on Ethereum. And so one Reddit user commented about this, that the hard fork is a compromise that ruins the integrity and signals that projects like the DAO can influence the underlying foundation to their own advantage. That the powerful few can cover up for their mistakes, but other users can't. In fact, one Reddit user even said, hey, I made a bad contract in the first days of ETH was online and I lost 2K with it. Can I also get it back? Thanks. And so you can clearly see why a lot of people are thinking that they would rather build on top of Bitcoin because even the founder of Ethereum asked his, his Twitter followers, at what level of a hack, at how much money lost to the ecosystem, would it be justified to intervene and to do a hard fork? And overwhelmingly, 63% of the founder of Ethereum's followers said intervention is never okay. Because intervention, again, benefits the few with the most power and doesn't benefit all of the users. 
And so if that wasn't enough to convince you that a lot of developers and amazing teams would prefer to build on Ethereum and even users would prefer their smart contracts to be settled onto Bitcoin, there's actually more. And that comes down to another innovation that the Stacks team came up with when it comes to their smart contracting language. And so decentralization makes the ledger, the ledger trustless, which means that when you have a smart contract, you know that the you can be confident that the node that's going to execute that smart contract is not going to be biased. But what about the smart contracts themselves? What about the developers of the decentralized apps that you're using? Well, when it comes to Solidity and Ethereum, the smart contracts are compiled. They're published in machine code, which means that users can't read them. And so would you sign a contract that you couldn't read? Well, the Stacks team has actually thought about this in advance, and they decide to create Clarity, which is an interpreted uh, programming language, so that you can actually have real trustless smart contracts with all of the apps that you use. And so when Ethereum code, Solidity code, is published on the blockchain, it's machine code, it's these ones and zeros, versus Clarity actually puts the source code that anyone can read, so you can read your smart contract when, you're, when you are um, using an app built on Stacks, and that really makes it trustless. And I think that's one of the biggest potential future opportunities for why Stacks is great. In addition to that, they also made their language Turing incomplete. And so what this means is that when it comes to Turing completeness, what Turing completeness means is that it can do anything a Turing machine can do. And Turing machines can have infinite loops. And so creating a uh, uh, having a Turing complete language means it's actually undecidable. You can not know in advance if a program is going to lead into an infinite loop. But with Clarity, they actually decided, hey, we want to have a decidable language. We want to make this Turing incomplete so that there's, it's not even possible to have an infinite loop. And what this means is that any smart contract written in Clarity can be independently audited and verified so that you know it's going to work. and You know it's not going to lead to a bug or to an infinite loop. You can take the smart contract that you're going to run on any decentralized app that you're working with, and then you can plug that into a third party to verify what it's going to do, because Clarity is a decidable language. And this is one of the things that I, I find really exciting. So how about the accelerator? Well, we kicked off the accelerator about a month ago, and we started with $4 million. We're investing $2 million per year, and we are investing in 100 different companies in the next two years. So while $4 million may, smell like a, may sound like a small amount of money, it's actually just for the first two years of this program. And so our goal is to invest in the 100 best founders in the world, bring them into stacks. And the way that we're doing that is by offering the best terms. We're offering the best terms and we're offering an incredible program. And so we offer up to 50K for every company without a valuation cap. That's the best deal you can get in venture and it's worked. We've got 25 amazing companies already, and we have lots of deal flow coming to us. We also offer additional funding to these companies through grants from our Stacks Foundation, which we work with, we work with closely. And that encourages the teams to um, contribute to open source. And so the Stacks Accelerator program is a three-month program. We start off with a product development camp. So we do a lot for these founders. I'm telling you, this is the most intense program that I've ever seen, and we are training these founders and covering them and making sure that they are like Delta Force trained founders coming out of this program. Month one, product development camp, we onboard them to Stacks, we give them development support, we bring in experts on branding and marketing, we give them UX and product feedback. Month two, we prepare them for pitching and fundraising. We go really deep, make sure that they understand how to fundraise, how to talk to investors, that their pitch is incredible. We talk to them about fundraising strategy, and we also have a vast network of mentors, more than 50 mentors and growing, working with our teams, helping them. And in the final month, we do the launch week and demo day. And during the launch week, the Stacks Foundation PR team, we support the companies, get them more users, and we have a demo day with more than 100 investors. And so this is the program this year, May, June, July. We do two programs per year. Um, the actual months are going to change in the future. And so this is the pyramid. We focus on validation first, making sure that they're solving a real pain in the market, helping them get traction, working on their branding, and helping them get funding. And this is an overview of our 12-week program. You can see that we 
we do a lot to support these founders. We, we meet with them every day, but of course we also give them lots of time to execute in their company. And so we're building, uh, we want to build the best community in the crypto industry, if not in the world, for these founders to be successful. And we also really focus on addressing the key risks that all blockchain projects fail. And the first one, here's our, here's our six reasons. The first one, of course, is building on the wrong platform. That risk is taken care of when people come to build on Stacks, and we truly believe that. Um, buggy code. Building things in clarity actually eliminates the code. We offer a lot of tech support and hiring support to our companies. Um, lack of skilled technical talent, lack of customers. The business doesn't make sense on blockchain, lack of smart money investors. We try to address all the risks involved in starting a new blockchain project. And we have already a community of exceptional mentors, of people who've been in the blockchain industry or been in the startup industry for a long time that can really guide our founders to be more successful. And so when it comes to our investment thesis, you can read more about our investment thesis on Medium at bit.ly slash stacks AC thesis. And our core thesis can be communicated in a single sentence. Our thesis is that we invest in teams who find an easy way to do something difficult. That's the one sentence thesis of our, of our fund. And so the key traits that we look for are skilled technical teams, of course, with a, a proven track record. They have to be committed full time. There's no part time in the startup world. We also look at people's cap tables. We look for a thoughtful and balanced equity share. We want to know how that the founders value each other, that the, the co-founders they brought on are worth the equity, and that they're going to be incentivized for the long term. We also look and talk to them about what their practical plans are. We look for strategic and intellectual flexibility. And we want the teams, we won't accept any team that's not ready to move fast when our program starts. We also take a special interest in underrepresented founders, and we take a special interest in founders who are already building the Stacks ecosystem, meaning that there's less technical risk and the community has validated them and shown that they are high potential. We're also interested in companies that are focused on big problems and pains, that are differentiated, um, consumer-facing products that can affect a lot of users, projects that leverage some of the unique features of Stacks, um, the, the stacking mechanism, the connection to Bitcoin, the ability to read Bitcoin state, which is a unique feature of Stacks. And we also look for high stakes use cases because we are an extremely secure blockchain based on our relationship with Bitcoin. And so these are some of the things that we give special consideration, but our core thesis is around the team, the founders. Can they find an easy way to do something difficult? Because startups are extremely hard. And a founder who wants to find a difficult way to do something difficult is not a founder that we're going to invest in. And so that's it. That's the introduction to Stacks Accelerator. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow us on Twitter, and we would love to have you be a part of our community. Thank you.